the more that the the media is attacking him and saying that he's politically finished, I think the more that he wants to go and run for office. Hello and welcome to Unheard, the channel that stands for independent thinking and against herd mentality wherever we see it. I'm Freddie Sayers. Donald J. Trump. Remember him? He was that guy we talked about all the time, every day for years. The whole Western world was pretty much obsessed with him. Well, one election and some comprehensive social media censorship later, it's almost hard to remember what it was like having him around. He's eerily silent. And what about Trump voters? That would be the 75 million Americans who wanted him back for a second term. We used to talk and worry a lot about them as well and what they were thinking and what they wanted, but now in mu much of the media, they seem to have all but disappeared. Well, here at Unheard, we don't have such short memories. We like to know what's going on in Trump land. Both the circle around the ex-president and the roughly half the country who supported him. What are they thinking? Well, here to help us find out is Jason Miller. He was chief spokesman for the Donald Trump campaign in 2016. Uh, he returned to a somewhat embattled re-election campaign in June 2020. He was co-host, along with Steve Bannon, of the War Room podcast, which was removed by YouTube in January after the events on Capitol Hill. And since then, he has been setting up a new media platform called Getter. He joins us now from New York City. Welcome, Mr. Miller. Good to be with you, at least virtually here. And thanks for having me on the show. So before we kick off, let me just ask straight up, are you still in touch with President Trump? And if so, how is he? Uh, I very much am. I just spoke with the president yesterday. Uh, he's in good spirits. We chatted a bit about the Getter platform uh, that we'll be talking about here. But uh, he is uh, always consuming and uh, watching all of the news all the time. And uh, his presence is very much felt in Republican politics. And I think with all this, this whole raft of Trump books that have come out in the, both the U.S. and in the U.K. markets, uh, it is all Trump all the time. I think three books in the Amazon top 10 are post-presidency books about Donald Trump. And everybody is fascinated with him, whether he's in the White House or out. So are, are you planning the campaign? I've got to ask. Uh, has he consulted with you about that? Is there a 2024 plan already? You know, it's interesting you say that. So there is a uh, essentially a political team uh, that's still around him. Uh, I was with that in a more formal capacity up until just uh, a month or month and a half ago when I left to take the CEO role with Getter. You know, if you'd asked me when President Trump uh, first left office, what the odds were of him running again in, in 2024, you know, I probably would have said 50 uh, 50. But I think in recent weeks, seeing him back out on the campaign trail, and it's it's kind of this the inverse effect where the more that the, the media is attacking him and saying that he's politically finished, I think the more that he wants to go and run for office, I'd probably put it at two to one odds uh, that, uh, that he does go and uh, run in 2024. So that's uh, making it more likely in my estimation that he's going to run in 2024. Yes. So I'm going to ask you to speculate. I know uh, professional uh, spokespeople don't like to speculate, but you're not a spokesman at this point. If he doesn't win the Republican nomination, what sort of odds would you put on him running as an independent? So 0% odds that he would run as an independent. I mean, the uh, the reality is in, in American politics where you have effectively the Republicans and Democrats, a two-party system, if you're going to um, if you're going to run as an independent, there have been a couple times in history where an independent has really had a shot. They have to have both a strong geographic base, uh, and then also a, a real unique uh, ideological base and something that could cut into, say, both parties. Uh, it, but it's it's very, very tough. It's doable, but it's tough. So I'd say 0% chance that President Trump would run as an independent. I would say with regard to polling on the Republican side, this is both when I was working for President Trump and now on the outside, he has a firm grip on the party. And the Republican Party is effectively Donald Trump. So I'm very keen to get onto your new platform and talk about that. And I thought one kind of runway up to it would be to go through the months before January and before that big moment of media censorship happened um, and get a bit of a sense of the timeline. So you were called up in June of 2020 to come back into the Trump team after there was some uh, turbulence there, some, some additional turbulence. What was the atmosphere like then back in June 2020 when you came back? Were, were people confident of a, of a victory in the presidential election? 
Uh, no, not at all. You know, when I came back, it was the week after the George Floyd killing. And so at that point, you had COVID shutdowns. Obviously, keep in mind that the COVID shutdown was, you know, what was that uh, effectively uh, about a six week stretch where the whole country was shut down and then in various phases. But then shortly thereafter, we started seeing the uh, obviously had the George Floyd killing and then we had the BLM protests start to pop up all around the country. And so all these different dynamics, the impact it was having on the economy, it was almost a, a, a three front war that President Trump was facing, maybe even a four front war. When you think about the Democrat opponents, uh, the BLM effort, the broader COVID, and then the economy. Uh, so it was tough. But the one thing, though, if you went through 2016 with President Trump and you survived things such as Access Hollywood and every other possible uh, tough thing, uh, the the Trump team is very much battle hardened. Uh, not exactly the the type of group that goes and hides under the covers. Uh, I mean, we're we're battle tested. But I will tell you at that stretch. In June of 2020, it was it was as tough of a position as I've ever seen. I mean, you mentioned the BLM protests there. In a way, that sort of issue should work well for Donald Trump. In a, in a way, it was strange that it wasn't more politically successful for him, don't you think? I mean, if he is the law and order president, and there were these uh, uh, there was unrest on the streets, what did he do wrong? What should he have done differently in order to actually? Uh, make that a successful issue for him. So uh, you make a really good point here because President Trump uh, was the law and order candidate. And uh, eventually we knew that the BLM movement would go too far. It didn't go too far quick enough, though, if that makes sense. So where we did see the numbers shift during the protests and such over the summer were with Hispanic and Latino voters. And this is something that a lot of folks in the U.S. don't understand. So I wouldn't expect uh, people in the U.K. To, to understand this particular nuance. But the backlash against the BLM spoke most loudly to Hispanic and Latino Americans, many of whom came from countries where crime was a big factor, where they saw the the, uh, the overreach of communism and the uh, so there was a big you know uh, many uh, folks from Central and South America didn't just come to the U.S. for the economy; they came for the safety and the law and order. So we saw a massive backlash. Um, against the BLM movement, against the Democrats, and helping us with Latino voters. But here's the thing that you got to keep in mind. Uh, Biden had both the media and big tech on his side. And so uh, big tech was always, everything is uh, in the media, everything is Donald Trump's fault. So it's heads we're right, tails Trump is wrong. And it probably, you know, if the election goes another month or so, the way that things were trending and the overreach with the BLM movement getting a little too crazy, I think President Trump wins. So you don't think, in retrospect, that he missed a trick there? I mean, you know, there was unrest in places like Portland, it was extended. And his response was, I would say, a little bit confusing. He was tweeting things that upset liberals, but there wasn't much action in terms of those, um, those weeks and months. Do you now think he should have done something different. Uh, you know, it, you raise a really good uh, uh, question here, and obviously hindsight's always a little bit um, twenty twenty. You know, during that month of July, the campaign spent approximately forty million U.S. dollars just on advertisements talking about law and order. But the challenge was that, in the eyes of the media, everything was being discussed through the lens of George, the George Floyd killing. It was remarkable. This goes to the whole point of part of the reason why we knew we had to set up another platform. When big tech and big media get out there and decide they're going to define things in certain terms, i.e., uh, you know, this is not about a summer of protests and a ruliness and lighting things on fire and torching neighborhoods. This is about the killing of George Floyd. That then impacts public thinking all around the country. We saw that later on with the quieting of the Hunter Biden laptop uh, issue, not just quieting, a complete blackout where, say, Facebook and Twitter said, nope, you're not going to be able to share the New York Post coverage of the Hunter Biden laptop scandal. And so when big tech and big media get together and collude on these things, it's, it's tough to cut through. What about COVID? That's another one that was happening right about then. Do you now think, again, with this convenient hindsight and 2020 vision, do you now think that things should have been done differently at that stage and that his chances of re-election might have been better had he reacted differently? So, uh, yeah, another good question here. Um, and, and I want to touch on one other thing from before, and this kind of goes to, uh, I think, some of the folks in the administration uh, on the law enforcement side did not do anywhere near as good of a job as they should have. 
Um, uh, look, it comes across as very awkward when you have the president of the United States saying, go arrest these people or stop this nonsense. Um, it's there, for example, the National Guard can only be brought in unless you, you go into some extreme cases when the local municipalities, uh, for example, go and say, we welcome you and bring you in. Well, I think Attorney General Bill Barr did a pretty piss poor job, uh, to be honest with you, uh, as far as shutting down some of these protests and the statue uh, destructions and lighting entire cities on fire. Uh, that that should have been done much better. You know, when you take a look then at COVID, I, I think the the one strategic mistake that I think that was made was the elevation of Dr. Anthony Fauci and some of the healthcare professionals, uh, or quote unquote healthcare professionals. I'd say more, more healthcare bureaucrats. And let me dive into that just for a moment so people understand what I'm saying. You, uh, there, a smart way, a smart way of thinking. There's not. This isn't a, a you know a misguided rationale. Is that the administration wanted to show that they had experts, they had people taking it seriously. And so you have the president up there with, say, with Fauci and Dr. Burks and Dr. Redfield and the Southers. And look, we're taking it seriously. We have all these experts up here. Here's the problem. The administration inadvertently made Dr. Anthony Fauci a superstar, not just a superstar in the U.S. He became a global superstar. Uh, I personally think that Fauci is a clown and he should have been fired. Uh, somehow this man is the highest paid member of government in the U.S. government. You think about everything the U.S. has to offer in Dr. Anthony Fauci is the highest paid. He's been there through seven presidencies. He's effectively a bureaucrat. What he's good at is keeping his job. Uh, and so his advice was so terrible. Go back to January when he said of 2020, when he said it was no big deal, uh, when he opposed the, uh, the travel bans with China and Europe, all the way as late as February 29th of 2020, where he was saying, don't worry, you don't need to wear masks. And now today, or literally just yesterday, he's saying we, he thinks every child to and up should be wearing a mask. Dr. Fauci. So your, crit your critique post. of Fauci is that he didn't take it seriously enough because a lot of people on the right of center feel that the interv interventions and the measures have been overly stringent. But what you're saying is he didn't realize soon enough how bad it was and he should have been more in favor of masks. Uh, actually, the, the point that I'm getting to, and, and maybe I didn't make it clear enough, is that he changes his opinion and he moves the goalposts constantly. And so uh, a year ago, no, we're never going to have to wear masks ever. Don't worry about that. This, is, this isn't a big deal. Now it's every child to and up has to wear a mask. And it's uh, the, the dynamics and the goalposts constantly shift. The, but what we did by putting Fauci on, on TV so much is he we elevated him. So then he became almost this uh, counterbalance to President Trump. The media set it up. So President Trump was the uh, the yin and Anthony Fauci was the yang kind of the. And so uh, I've made the comment before that Anthony Fauci, in many ways, was Joe Biden's most effective campaign trail surrogate. He was the single best ally that Joe Biden had for a third party validator because he would constantly undermine President Trump. Uh, he uh, he couldn't stay off of TV. I think he's literally uh, addicted to to being on television. And his advice was just bad. It changes literally on a week by week basis. Uh, it always rushes to the to the extremes. And again, here's the thing to keep in mind. And this this is goes to things of why your show is so important. And we talk about uh, don't be you know, don't be sheep. Don't fall into the uh, the herd mentality is that Dr. Fauci, in his mind, hey, let's just keep it all locked down. We're all fine. We can have it locked down in perpetuity. Well, if you're an hourly wage earner, if you're, for example, a truck driver, if you're someone who works at a restaurant, hundreds of thousands of restaurants and bars that close down in the US, they'll never reopen. You can't stay locked down. You're not on salary. You have to get out there and work every hour. And so the, the notion that we'll just stay locked down forever only works if you're, say, a salaried person uh, who uh, may be a white collar person who can afford to do that. And I, I just think that Fauci would, the pendulum would swing on his, his bad advice. But I do think the administration elevated Fauci. Uh, other thing, I would have fired Fauci, uh, would have taken the bullet. Um, what I mean by that is just it would have been a negative news cycle, maybe a negative week, but he caused so much damage. Uh, I would have fired him long ago. Okay, so we've got we got one thing there, which is uh, uh, Fauci was given too much prominence and um, you, you would have got rid of him. I guess what I'm asking in the bigger picture is, you were brought in as a senior advisor, expert in how to deal with the media. And yes, you can complain that the media was biased or it was structured against the president, but you were there to work with the media as it was and for him to win. And he didn't. He lost. So what is your 
retrospective analysis now. Do, do you think that was a winnable campaign? I mean, according to your side, Joe Biden is a semi-senile near octogenarian who was, you know, he was making speeches to empty car parks. This should have been easy for you. Why did you lose? Well, I think a couple of things. I think when you, um, uh, the biggest group where we underperformed were with people who uh, had a negative uh, image of both candidates. That was a group that President Trump won 90 to 10 over crooked Hillary Clinton in 2016. But we lost with that group in um, in 2020. And primarily a lot of those folks who had negative opinions of both candidates, uh, and this again, kind of put on my, uh, my, my politics and communications hat, uh, is because these are non-political people. They don't really care about the politics. What they want is to get life back to normal. I think that our messaging down the final three to four weeks of the campaign, I think was very good. Uh, I do think that probably from Labor Day on, uh, we probably should have made that pivot uh, about at least two, if we'd made that pivot maybe uh, several weeks earlier with the simple message of we're going to get life back to normal, Joe Biden's going to keep you in the basement, make it very simple, make the binary choice Biden basement, Trump life back to normal. We'd started that maybe like around Labor Day. And here's the other thing too. You're talking about 44,000 votes uh, over spread over three states. Um, so, I mean, you can, it's one of those, you could pick one thing. You could say that uh, if the, the Hunter Biden laptop story had gotten out, that could have swung it. Uh, all these small little things, but on variables that we could control, um, I think the messaging was spot on the last three, four weeks, if we'd started that, we're going to get life back to normal, that real tight message. Okay, so we're drawing in now in our little timeline to the January the 6th events. Um, and that, of course, is significant historically, but it was also significant for you because it was in the aftermath of that, that not only the president was banned from all the major social media platforms, but even your own uh, podcast with Steve Bannon was thrown off YouTube. That's really when the, the power of social media networks became clear. But let me ask you the same question. You were there, you were in the room, you were advising the president. Do you now think that the day of the January the 6th and his reaction was mishandled and you should have done things differently? You know, that's it's tough to say on January 6th. So yes, I was advising the president and uh, as I was active with him and drafting the statement that we put out that evening and obviously spoke to them in the morning is being a campaign advisor. And again, in the post-election construct, I was not actually inside the White House. Uh, and so, for example, I yeah, I spoke with the president in the morning. I spoke with him in the evening, did not speak with him essentially in the, the middle of the day. I uh, was in touch with certain folks in the White House, but I, I wasn't there in the room. Um, uh, but I, I do think that uh, with regard to the uh, with regard to the messaging, uh, you know, that's it's tough to go and say, um, you know, kind of the, the hindsight, again, is always 2020. If something could have been said earlier, something could have been said uh, more clear. Uh, you know, once the uh, once the, the violence started, though, I think that there really was there was no uh, one magical statement, for example, that could have been said that would have changed the, the overall uh, storyline in the media. So what were, what uh, were so, you advising on that morning call? Were you saying, look, Mr. President, we need to put out a message very clearly saying violence is not acceptable. If you're coming to D.C., do so peacefully. Otherwise, don't come at all. Is that what you told him or, or what did you tell him? So, you know what, that's uh, that's uh, and sometimes just because you're you're so into it, you kind of forget to take a step back and make sure to explain folks. So uh, let me make sure uh, people understand what January 6 was. So January 6 is the day in uh, uh, in our electoral system when the actual electoral votes are counted. So that's where uh, each of the 50 states, have, they've ratified their elections, they send up and each state has a certain number of electoral votes based on population. Uh, they come up there and it's a largely ceremonial or traditionally in the past has been largely ceremonial where the vice president, who is his role of the leader of the Senate, the figurehead lead of the Senate or the tiebreaker, gets up there and they say, Arizona, X number of uh, electoral votes for this candidate, Alabama, this number of like, so they kind of go through this process. All of the conversation leading up to January 6 was about how Vice President Pence was going to react. Would he take uh, what some say uh, would be a constitutional authority to say uh, there's considerable concern with the way the ballots in a certain state were counted? Uh, I'm going to send this back to the state legislatures to review it, uh, make sure they perform an audit before we go and count, say, Arizona or Georgia or Wisconsin. 
literally 99% of the conversation going up to January 6 was about how this was going to uh, play out with Vice President Pence. So the, the rally aspect, as far as there was the rally in front of the White House, and then there ended up being uh, then the, the march up to the Capitol and some of the violence that, that ensued, what, what that actually happened, that really wasn't even anything that was being um, – even being discussed. I mean, I know when I chatted with the president that morning, he said, "Hey, what is the uh, what does the crowd size look like?" And I had Fox News on in the background. I said, oh, "It looks pretty uh, uh, pretty packed." Uh, they have a correspondent down there. But as far as the actual uh, the capital dynamic, what then ensued the, with the violence and such, that literally wasn't on anyone's mind. Now, that might seem a little bit of uh, a little bit of a, a shocking thing, but uh, and this has been described in some of these post election books that have come out. But the aspect of uh, the the whole you know rally at the Capitol and the outside dy- dynamics, that was such a, a distant you know nobody knew that that part. When I say nobody knew, I mean within the uh, kind of the Trump key advisors, we were all focused on what was going to happen when Vice President Pence got to those specific states. Okay, so there were people outside that were going to be having a rally. Or, okay, uh, big deal. That's in our minds. That was just okay. They'll be there and they'll have some banners and they'll cheer that kind of thing. What then ensued, though, at the Capitol, nobody expected. The Capitol Police didn't expect it. Nobody on the Republican or Democrat side expected it. And so it, it might seem uh, kind of a big revelation that, that people didn't realize this was uh, this was going to happen. But the focus was all on what was going to be happening inside the Capitol that day. And it was not at all until that afternoon uh, that obviously we saw those things start to play I mean, out. I, I gotta say, I do remember quite a lot of discussion in the days leading up to January the 6th, and certainly the liberal leaning papers were anxious about whether there might be violence. It was discussed that there would be a protest. Uh, they were going around social media with this uh, January the 6th date. Um, so there was a certain sense of foreboding as to what might happen. And viewing from afar, it, it definitely had the feeling that the president allowed it to get quite far very far uh, although, let me, before he let finally me. spoke up. And I'm just wondering, politically speaking, had he spoken earlier and been clearer and been less tempted to show his muscle and show that he could get a gang together on the, on the streets of DC, might he be in a stronger political situation now? Uh, so uh, let me go, go back to one point here. With regard to what was expected in the run-up to, uh, to January 6th, the, uh, the little bit of reporting that was done actually made it sound as though there were going to be a number of different, uh, essentially, mini rallies around the city. Uh, there'd be some folks downtown, some folks at the Ellipse on the National Mall. Um, there was uh, one, the the Capitol dynamic was just one of four different uh, potential, uh, whether it be uh, protests or rallies or things going on. But the violence, uh, the only aspect of violence that uh, before January 6th was brought up in any way, was could there be some uh, Antifa versus Trump supporter clashes downtown as had been seen on December 12th? And so I, I just want to make that clear for folks who are watching the show that there was uh, there was no talk anywhere about uh, potentially violence at the Capitol or uh, did we see this thing coming or uh, and certainly by no means was the president or anyone on his team encouraging people to uh, to take unlawful action at the Capitol. The violence that was being described were maybe the 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 right of center proud boys fight with the left of center antifa uh knuckleheads downtown and cause some skirmish that's the only aspect where there was uh there was any sort of aspect of of violence now with regard to the president's action uh, could the president have been uh more definitive could he have uh, uh, said things an hour earlier say that than he did uh of course i mean every little thing then has an impact uh but it would fundamentally changed uh, what either what happened that day uh, or the way that the media portray it, or essentially where uh, the current standing American politics, which is uh, the leader of the Republican Party, uh, you have people on the other side who are very passionate, who are against them. I don't think it, it ultimately would have changed um, for the simple fact that once you once you have people do something like breach the Capitol, uh, that that's going to be uh, that's going to be uh, essentially uh, burned in everyone's memories uh, for quite a while. The events of January the sixth came out of the bigger question post the uh, election day itself, which was that President Trump rejected the result. He didn't believe it. Um, And that was the energy behind those rallies. Uh, A new opinion poll out yesterday showed that 40% um, of people in the US still believe that there was substantial fraud at the time of the election. 
again, is it not now possible, looking back, that had he, with good grace on the election night, conceded, said, I, I've lost, I'm going to play by the rules, but we'll be back in 2024, he might today be a much more powerful figure with a greater chance of re-election than this bizarre thing of rejecting the result. You know, everything is is become so politically polarized in the U.S. that uh, I don't think that would be the case uh, for the simple fact that I think that people are, are effectively in their camps. Uh, either they're going to be with President Trump or they're going to be against President Trump or with Biden or against Biden. Uh, there is with President Trump, there is no such thing as media goodwill. Um, you know, even if the president's having the, the best day ever during his administration, that would usually last about an hour or two until one of the, the major news outlets would uh, drop some story saying that, you know, here's some scandal or they try to invoke Russia or, you know, collusion or, uh, you know, some investigation. So the, uh, in fact, the, it was about two or three hours from when they called the election in 2016 um, to that next morning on CNN when they started attacking him at 6 a.m. Um, and so he literally had about two and a half hour, quote unquote, honeymoon. Uh, and they just started off with trying to delegitimize his presidency. And so uh, I don't think that that fundamentally, uh, if he had you know, taken one particular route or tact. Uh, so you don't, but there, you don't have any any regrets. I guess that's what I'm saying to you. You, you know, you were the, a senior advisor well, on that campaign. It yeah, wasn't successful. No, I, I, what's what's the regret here? I think we're, we're looking for some sort I think of... The, I think the... Uh, look, I, I think that on the election integrity front, uh, it's clear that, that we need to have... Uh, a much stronger effort with the with the lawyers and being ready to go, and that's something that President Trump has uh, has even said himself. Um, and I think that where uh, where we did have the specific examples, uh, and just to make sure people understand really kind of uh, where the the election fraud concerns were, kind of splits out into two camps. So you have an Article Two of our Constitution; it gives the state legislatures the sole authority to set the terms for elections uh, in their respective state. What happened in 2020 was that many Democratic governors or Democratic municipalities circumvented that and essentially went to systems where they would just send ballots out to people, all in the guise of COVID. It's too dangerous to go to the polls. So we're just going to go and send ballots everywhere or set up these uh, sketchy drop boxes uh, for collecting ballots where there's no chain of custody uh, records or anything like that. And so uh, from that aspect, many of these voting rules were changed. That's one side of it. The other side are the actual fraud and irregularities, where we did see a number of that with, obviously, there were some uh, pretty high publicized cases with regard to machine malfunctions on election night. But as we've moved further away from the election, that uh, has been more of really Arizona and Georgia, the two states where uh, there have been some big concerns. If you go back uh, and say, just specific to the Article 2 violations, with essentially Democrats kind of changing the rules of the game during the game, so to speak, uh, then uh, that obviously was enough to uh, to change the election. Uh, obviously, it would have been nice to have won that in the courts. In fact, even the uh, state of Wisconsin Supreme Court decision, which we only lost four to three, and the ruling there was just very simply, if you want to vote by mail in the state of Wisconsin, you have to apply for a ballot. Um, well, they didn't do that. They basically, under the guise of COVID, sent people ballots, and, and we only lost that decision four to three, and they basically said, you're right, but we're not getting back. We're not going to invalidate uh, people who thought that they were voting legally. But, and so, but if, if uh, yeah, it, you know, the, what I'm hearing is that you, you didn't go hard enough on the on the stop this deal. Basically, you should have done a more effective campaign. I mean, is it in, in advance? In advance. And so, right. for example, as we were down the home stretch, uh, yes. No, I would say that that was the. But uh, if it was, was but the, if it was such a good issue. legal argument, why was it so spectacularly unsuccessful? It didn't work. Lots and lots of courts considered it and threw it out, even up to the Supreme Court, part of whom uh, was appointed by your president. They weren't interested either. It, it, it flopped. Uh, maybe well, in retrospect, there, you should be thinking it wasn't such a great strategy. Well, I, I think that uh, I, I think, you know, there are, on some of these issues, it's a matter of jurisdiction. They say you don't have the, the proper standing for going and filing some of these. Uh, but I think that the what became uh, pretty apparent uh, pretty quickly is that even if ballots were distributed in a 
uh, in a, uh, I, I say illegal, meaning that it's outside of the norms of the law, but it's not as if I, I don't want to seem like I'm equating it to being, a, uh, you know, like robbing a convenience store or something. Uh, but you have, say, an improperly uh, distributed ballot, for example, um, that the courts very simply are never going to uh, invalidate people who believe that they were voting uh, legally and lawfully. And uh, from that aspect, I do think that some of these uh, lawsuits uh, should not have been pursued um, once it was clear that that was going to be the case. Uh, but I do think that, like in particular, uh, a couple of the Supreme Court efforts and also with that state of Wisconsin, for example, I mean, those were very sound, very uh, well thought out, put together arguments. Uh, but some of them, obviously, like you said, uh, were spectacularly unsuccessful. And some of those probably should not have been pursued once it was clear that uh, the courts just weren't going to invalidate um, improperly distributed uh, ballots um, because the people didn't realize that they were improperly distributed. Okay, so let's let's leave that and let's go on to your new platform, which is I'm sure what you would rather be talking about. So there was that weird week after January the 6th in which the sitting president of the United States was thrown off Facebook and Twitter within days and suddenly his megaphone was taken away from him it's been pretty effective, hasn't it? I mean, he, he seems, he, he occasionally does phones, phone ins to Fox News, he sends out email, press releases, but his, his ability to communicate is enormously restricted. Oh, absolutely. And, and that's, uh, look, let's just make sure that we're, we're clear uh, what, so everyone realizes what's happening here. Not only what we've seen this erosion of free speech and the erosion uh, of just basic speech rights in the United States of what's happened over this past year. I mean, we go back to the way that people started becoming deplatformed or or censored if they would criticize Dr. Fauci or the way that government or even uh, raising questions about the origin of COVID-19, uh, the Wuhan lab uh, origin, which last year that was a taboo. You couldn't talk about that. That was bad. You could get censored or deplatformed. Of course, now it's all proven to be. Not to be true, or all the at least all the bread breadcrumbs all lead to one place, right to the lab. But then we saw with the Hunter Biden laptop scandal, and just to be clear, what folks what that is. So Hunter Biden, uh, a laptop uh, that he owned, which basically had a lot of information about his family's business dealings. And essentially, there's been about a half century of grift, uh, for lack of a better term, between Hunter Biden and James and Frank, the two brothers of Joe Biden. They basically made money selling access to Joe Biden for a half century. And a lot of business deals, things with uh, obviously Ukraine, uh, uh, things with China, number of different countries. And when that story came out, the New York Post got their hands on this laptop and reported it. You had social media giants, these three guys in Silicon Valley say, nope, you're not allowed to share it because we don't think it's real. Of course, it turns out to be real. But then to your point, the president of the United States gets his First Amendment rights completely knocked out and undercut, kicked off of all platforms after January 6th and effectively saying that he has a lifetime ban of being able to use his First Amendment right. And I think that is a, I think that's dangerous. And you see even where we are now, we have the White House saying, well, if you've been kicked off of one platform, you should probably be kicked off of all the platforms. Uh, advocating, uh, you have uh, the White House of the United States of America advocating that people lose all of their First Amendment rights. Uh, and then guess what? Then we're all going to be sheep. Then we're all going to be one big herd. If you can't have any pushback, you can't talk about things. So coming out of that, uh, we started working on Getter. Actually, Getter started back in the fall. Um, some really hardworking engineers and some smart people have been fortunate enough to team up with started developing this. We want to have something where you can have free speech. You can reject cancel culture. And I think too often the uh, uh, the the upstarts are told, "Hey, you can have your own uh, your own version of a Twitter or Facebook or uh, some other social media uh, platform, but it's going to be inferior." And you're not going to have funding and just go over to your corner with your uh, with your people and have it. So what we did is we're like, you know what? We're actually going to beat the liberals at their own game. We're going to go and have a social media platform that's better, that's sharper, that has cooler features. And we're going to make sure that people are never deplatformed or censored for expressing their political beliefs. And that's what we've started to do here. So let me throw one argument uh, back at you, which is actually the libertarian argument that I hear a lot which funnily enough is now being deployed by uh, people who are far from being libertarians. And they say, well, Facebook is a private entity. Twitter is a private company. You talk about First Amendment rights. Well, 
to interfere with their right to decide who they want on their platform is itself a form of censorship. And a, and a more libertarian view would be that those private companies should be allowed to do what they want. And if you don't like it, do what you're doing and set up something else. What do you say to that argument? Well, uh, I mean, not uh, um, not entirely wrong on that. I mean, that's a, a pretty spirited debate. And so what folks uh, should understand is that all of the online, essentially all the online speech rules, so to speak, uh, that we see now were set back in the 1990s before we even had uh, any of these social media platforms. It was more to, uh, to speak to uh, blogs or traditional blogs or different things. And so what it does is it basically gives immunity or uh, as long as there's a good Samaritan or good, uh, good faith effort to, to moderate or regulate some of these things, where if you're simply uh, a forum or an outlet where people can post things on their own, then you're not held responsible for the content as opposed to say, uh, if you're a publisher, say if you're the, the Telegraph or the Guardian uh, or something like that, you are responsible for every word on your pages that then go out. And so uh, that's the, so what the, I do think there's an inherent challenge where uh, the social media giants hide behind this section 230 protection saying, well, wait a minute, um, you know, it's not us saying it, it's just people on here, you can't sue us. But then they also want to pick winners and losers as far as whose free speech actually matters. So Again, two things to be true at the same time here. That's a big, massive problem. We've got to figure out how to deal with it. I don't think the courts are going to move quick on it. Um, I, I mean, I support, obviously, what President Trump's doing, but I just don't think the courts will move super fast. Uh, I don't think Congress is ultimately going to deal with it right. I mean, there's, there's some very good members of Congress, uh, especially the ones who are on Getter. Uh, but you also have a lot of dead weight in Congress and folks who just they, they wouldn't know the difference between a tweet and a truck. Where, where did the money come from? Uh, so the money came from, so we have a, a consortium of international investors who've put in money to start. Uh, and these, there's a reason why you don't see uh, a whole lot of social media companies uh, popping up because A, it's expensive and B, it takes a long time. Uh, and C, you got to uh, have some really smart people that are doing it. And so initially we have uh, uh, several of these international investors who put in money, but obviously as we go to next rounds of fundraising and things like that, then we'll start to add additional folks. But it's a, it's a US-based company, uh, Delaware-based uh, company right. and uh, privately held. So are you going to try and get uh, Donald to give some money? Presumably that's one of the things that comes up in your conversations. It might turbocharge your network. Is, is that a, a possibility? Uh, other, other way around. Most of the conversations go to uh, uh, what the compensation or what uh, what might be in it for uh, for President Trump to, to join the platform. And, and to be clear, he has offers from several different platforms. So he's. Uh, I know he has a lot of different places to think through. But uh, oh, and I'm, I very much hope that we'll get President Trump to, to join the platform. How much and, does he want? Uh, I, uh, I'll keep the. Uh, I don't want to negotiate against myself, so I'll, I'll keep the <laughs> keep those between uh, the, the president, and president and me as far as our conversations. Uh, but he knows that uh, he knows that we want him on the platform. Uh, that we're over a million and a half users, um, and so we've already gotten off to a smashing success. Everyone from Secretary Mike Pompeo and Secretary Car Ben Carson are on the platform. Uh, president Bolsonaro from Brazil, uh, Fabio Bolsonaro, his son. A uh, number of uh, prominent members of Congress and uh, people from kind of all across the, the spectrum um, uh, have joined the platform and, and we think it's going to keep growing. So here's, I think, one of the challenges you might have, and I'd be interested what response you had to this, which is that those kinds of networks, and there have been previous attempts to do this, there are some concurrently, end up quite often becoming a magnet for the most extreme elements. Uh, you mentioned Bolsonaro, the uh, populist president of Brazil, is one of your early um, sign-ups. I mean, there'll probably be a good chunk of even Trump voters in the US who would have issues with President Bolsonaro if they heard his social media uh, feed. How do you avoid it just becoming more and more and more right until it's a pool of extremists who put up off anyone who is just a centrist? Well, I think there are a couple of things that one, I think the international aspect of a platform actually very much helps uh, in having the diversity of, um, of thought and ideas. I mean, uh, folks in, uh, yes, uh, there are different politics in play and say in the UK and Brazil and in Japan, but in none of those three countries, for example, does anyone wake up in the morning and say, I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican. 
Um, and in many, many of the places, people might not even wake up and say, I'm a, a liberal or I'm a conservative on, on some kind of, you know, again, this binary choice, uh, uh, ideological orthodoxy. Uh, most people just want to, again, kind of get life back to normal. They're tired of the uh, the elites, uh, the Silicon Valley, big tech giants telling them what they can and can't say. They want to be able to connect with friends and family on social media. They want to get breaking news updates. Those are really the two main reasons why people go on social media. So I think the international component very much helps with that, having a lot of different thought and opinions. Uh, but we're also making a big effort to, to get people who have different points of view. Uh, for example, I'm um, just finalizing, uh, I think we'll have the contract going out the door today, uh, but to someone who actually worked for a Democrat 2020 presidential campaign, and uh, to come on as our director of Democratic engagement, and we'll be looking to to get people to round out the, uh, I guess you'd say, kind of the the uh, the broader thought spectrum, uh, or the to bridge those traditional divides uh, in uh, in all of our key markets. Now, am I expecting that we're going to be in some 50-50 balance between? Republicans and Democrats in the U.S. anytime soon? No, and I wouldn't even pretend that. Am I going to make an effort to bring in as many Democrats and people with competing thoughts? You better believe it. Are you worried, if you are successful, that actually an America or a world where there are parallel institutions and there's a left-leaning social media world and a right-leaning social media world and the same thing happens with Hollywood and happens with education, is that you end up with just two nations that have no contact with each other whatsoever, and that polarization is just going to get worse and worse and worse until it breaks. Does that worry? So actually, I'd, actually, I'd, I'd, I'd push back on that and say, uh, even going back to the, uh, the herd mentality aspect of right now there's one. Right now, there's one system. There's not even a, a dueling system. I mean, if we're lucky and we continue to grow, continue to build, then we'll at least have an alternative where people can express their thought. But if, if folks are left with only Twitter, if they're left with only Facebook and the orthodoxies and the herd mentalities that go with, uh, say, with those two outlets in particular, then what kind of free global free speech is that? That means that people are effectively silenced. They're told to shut up. So what we want to do is make sure that everybody has a voice. We want to make sure there's a platform, uh, which is part of the reason why we launched Getter, where you'll never get censored or deplatformed simply for speaking your political views. So what we're doing is, and this is actually kind of the, the cool thing, is that uh, I get to go and tell people what they can do. I want to go and tell people, here's a way that you can have your voice, how you can express yourself. And that's what we're doing, because the, the worst thing we could do is say, hey, we're just going to have a, a one system, one channel for people to communicate on. I mean, that's, the, that's your George Orwell 1984 right there. So 2024, do you drop the reins and go back to the Trump campaign? Uh, regardless of, uh, of of what I say or uh, you know what I uh, might plan on doing if President Trump runs, of course I'm going to be helping President Trump. Uh, so uh, uh, you know it's like the the gravitational pull of the sun. Uh, there, you know there's uh, uh, there's not much I you know uh, not much I could, I could say. I mean of course I'll I'll be there to help President Trump uh, if uh, if he decides to run again. But you know we'll, we'll see when he's got a little time before he makes his decision. Jason Miller, thank you so much. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. Very in depth. That was Jason Miller, a senior advisor to President Trump. He advised him in 2016. He came back for the 2020 campaign, which, as we discussed, was not successful. Um, he is setting up a new social media platform. There are others about, but it was interesting to hear what his ideas were. And also, even though we might not agree with him, just to hear a little bit about that campaign. You don't hear it discussed very much, even though this historic event happened only less than a year ago. So thanks to him for joining. Thanks for you for watching. This is Unheard.